Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard. I'm the author of Visualizing Happiness in Every Area of Life and host of this podcast, Incredible Life Creator. And today, my guest is Miss Paula Casey. Hey, Paula. Hey, Kimberly. So excited to have you on. But just so people can know you, I'm going to go ahead and read your bio. Paula F. Casey of Memphis has dedicated more than 30 years educating the public about Tennessee's pivotal role in the 19th Amendment's ratification with the video, book, ebook, audiobook, and public art. She is also engaging an engaging speaker on the 19th Amendment and voting rights. She produced the video Generations American Women Win the Vote in 1989 and the book Perfect 36 Tennessee Delivers Women's Suffrage. In 1998, the ebook and audiobook in 2013. She has helped place these suffrage monuments inside the state capital of Tennessee. She co founded the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Heritage Trail that highlights the monuments, markers, grave sites, and suffrage related sites. She chairs the National Votes for Women Trail and is also the state coordinator for Tennessee. Well, welcome to the podcast, Paula. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I always love to talk about this topic. Yes. And I am just, like I said, thrilled to have you on today because I am one of those people that is beyond patriotic. And I think I'm so thankful that we have civil rights for people here in the U.S. and hopefully across the world. And I am you know, a fighter of people's civil rights, however that shows up, no matter who you are, I don't care your race, who you are, you know, woman, man, everyone has those basic rights and should have those basic rights. And I'm so thankful when I meet someone like you who has um, not only fought for them, but you have helped preserve the history of this because, we, you know, sometimes we forget our history and the history is just so so important and it's important to preserve it for our young people because a lot of times they think well well it's just always been this way well no it hasn't always been this way so they need to understand the fight the struggle you know the things that we had to do to get these rights so again just so excited to have you on and just so people can get to know you and who you are and how you got started why don't you tell us about you Well, my background was in newspapers and journalism. I'm a journalism graduate from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Go Lady Vols. Mm -hmm. I was up there in the 70s when Pat Head, later Summit, was hired. So I've been a Lady Vols fan before it was cool. So I actually had quite a bit of exposure to this history when I was at the University of Tennessee in the early to mid-70s. I went to the Tennessee Women's Meeting, which was a precursor to the National Women's Conference in November of 1977, and I met Carol Lynn Yellen. Carol Lynn came to Memphis, originally from Oklahoma, went through New York City, ended up in Memphis. She and her husband, David, came to Memphis so that he could help found the broadcasting department at then Memphis State University. And Carol Lynn stumbled upon this suffrage history in 1970. So when I met her in 1977, you know, we talked about it a little bit. And I didn't live in Memphis then. I moved to Memphis in January of 1981. And my husband, Richard, we got married in 82. And we came to Memphis and loved it. And we both grew up in Nashville. And I love Nashville. They're both great cities. And of course, the 19th Amendment was ratified in Nashville, August 18th, 1920. But Carol Lynn wrote an article in the December 1978 edition of American Heritage Magazine. And in that article, she explained everything that had happened in Tennessee because nobody was really paying attention. And in 1970, when you think back, that was the 50th anniversary, and you think people would be paying attention to these milestone anniversaries, nobody really thought much about it. It's like, oh yeah, women were voting. You know, who paid any attention to this? So Carol Wynn took it upon herself to make sure that this history was preserved, and that's what she impressed upon me. So 
When they cut so much out of her article in 1978, she told me in 1989 that she wanted to do a book. And so I thought, oh, okay, yeah, great, we'll do a book. You know, this is before publishing on demand. I mean, the world has changed so much in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So bottom line, we ended up doing this book, The Perfect 36, Tennessee Delivers Women's Suffrage. And it was published originally in May of 1998. Carol Lynn died of breast cancer in March of 1999. So I was able to put that book in her hands. And Dr. Jan Sherman moved to Memphis with her husband in 1994. So in 1995, we did this big 50th anniversary commemoration. And it was then State Senator Steve Cohen, who is now my congressman from Memphis. Steve spearheaded the effort to put suffragist public art inside the state capitol because prior to February 1998, there was nothing. So this is what is inside the Tennessee state capitol. It's a bar relief sculpture showing a woman rising up out of the sea of disinterested men. And she's poking the state capitol for women to win the right to vote. And Kimberly, I've got to tell you one of my biggest pet peeves is books that say, particularly history books, textbooks. American women were given the right to vote as though it were bestowed by some benevolent entity. No, they fought for 72 years, the greatest nonviolent struggle in the history of our country for American women to win the right to vote. And it's a great history. Beautiful. So um, tell me a little bit about you. What were you doing when you when you met Carolyn? Where you said you were a, a journalist. Were you a journalist for a newspaper, or how did that all come about? I was working in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is on the Tennessee Kentucky line by Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Love Clarksville. I grew up in Nashville. Clarksville is like 45, 50 miles north, and I loved being in the newspaper business. And I have to tell you, in the 70s, we could never have envisioned what has happened to newspapers. Everybody read newspapers back then. Unfortunately, people don't read them now like they should. But let me tell you, the best thing about newspapers is that it is the first draft of recorded history. That's why working on this book, we did our, our video, which became a DVD and now streaming video. We were researching newspapers. You go to the public library, you look at the microfilm and the microfiche, and you see all of those old newspapers. I mean, it's so cool. And I thought about what are people going to be doing decades from now and when we're all gone, researching what happened because newspapers do not occupy the place that they used to. People get their news from so many different places. And yes, we still have newspapers, but they are not as predominant as they were in the 70s and even the 80s and, and 90s. But you know what? I read three newspapers online a day, and I never thought I'd see the day when I wouldn't have a physical newspaper delivered, but here we are. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And the one thing about anything that's on the computer, or on the internet, it can be changed. I mean, if um, anybody's ever read that book, 1984, where they were changing the news every day. And for young people who haven't read that, <laughs> that was a book where you thought in 1984, there would be all this spying and the government and, and um, a lot of it has actually come true. Yeah. We just have to kind of focus on the things that, that matter. And for me, it has been the suffrage movement, the greatest nonviolent revolution in the history of our country. And because of Carol Lynn and Dr. Sherman, us working on this book and doing the video, the DVD, and then in 2013, I had Dr. Sherman read the audio book. And we also did the ebook and all of the ebook formats. My whole goal in this is what Carol Lynn impressed upon me and that is that this history must be preserved now 2020 was the centennial of tennessee's final ratification when the 19th amendment came law and you know we went through a pandemic mm -hmm. and technically we're still in it COVID is not over 
However, the suffragists also endured a pandemic from 1918 to 1920. It was the flu pandemic. And two of the leading suffrage leaders, Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul, both had the flu and fortunately they didn't die, but they won. And Kimberly, I think that's what's so important when we look at this movement about perseverance and persistence and coming through all kinds of obstacles, they overcame them. So our 2020 celebration was not what we would have wanted, but the celebration continues because people continue to read the books and learn about it. And let me tell you, the next big milestone is going to be 2026 when the United States celebrates the 250th anniversary. So I am working to make sure that the book, ebook, audiobook, everything is there so that when historians are researching significant political and social movements, they will find this information. And that's why I agreed to chair the National Votes for Women Trail, because I want people to see this history. We've got markers and monuments and grave sites and residences that tell the story. Beautiful. So, you know, you said they that the women have been really struggling and fighting for like 72 years. So how did it start out and how do they even get a leg up? Because, you know, that length of time, um, women couldn't even own their own property. Not only can they get and vote, they couldn't own their own property. So if they weren't married, they couldn't even own things. I think it's a possibility that they couldn't even have their own bank account without a, a man, you know, their father or a brother or a husband um, giving them access to a bank account. So how did, who started out putting this together and how did they start to get that leg up and start working it into motion? During the Revolutionary War, women were swept up in the call for liberty and equality. And so there were women, even during the Revolutionary War, who thought, mm, you know, we're helping start this new country. Maybe we should vote. So I'm sure you've heard the story about Ad Abigail Adams writing to her husband, John, remember the ladies. And he just blew it off and said she was saucy. And, you know, the idea of women having equal rights and being equal participants in a democracy was essentially laughed off. But the idea took root. And after the Revolutionary War, there were attempts for women to participate in this whole experiment called democracy and self-government, because that's what this is really about. And this is the way I want to frame this. This is about democracy. You either believe in democracy or you don't. Well, I happen to believe in it and I happen to be a champion of democracy because that's what the suffragists were. And I want to point out that in the United States, the correct term is suffragist, the British, were the suffragettes, and they were considered so radical that the Americans referred to themselves as suffragists. So in the United States, anyone who advocates for the right to vote is a suffragist. So the suffragists went along, and in 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her friend, Amelia Bloomer, and Lucretia Mott, and several other women, and Lucretia Mott's husband, put together the Seneca Falls Convention. And I have been to Seneca Falls. Let me tell you, I called my mother when I was up there, and I said, I'm in Mecca. I mean, it was just so exciting to be there, because there's so much history up there around the Finger Lakes and upstate New York. But they had this convention for two days. And they patterned their Declaration of Sentiments after the Declaration of Independence. Mm. And it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton who broached this radical idea of women voting. And people were taken aback like, oh. And she persisted. And I'm very fortunate to have met and talked with her great-great-granddaughter, Colleen Jenkins, who was also involved with the National Votes for Women Trail. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton never wavered. Well, and this was 1848. 
Susan B. Anthony was not there at that founding convention. Amelia Bloomer introduced them in 1851, and that's when their great partnership began. Here was Elizabeth Cady Stanton married with seven children. Susan B. Anthony was the Spencer school teacher who was able to go out on the road, travel, give speeches. Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped write them. She helped steer the philosophy. She was brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And Susan B. Anthony listened and learned from her. And Susan B. Anthony never gave up. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton died in 1902, and Susan B. Anthony died in 1906. So they were the first wave of suffragists. It was three plus generations. So they died before ratification. And when Tennessee ratified in 1920, it was like all those decades of work came to fruition because what they wanted was for women to participate in their government. Now, does that seem radical? It probably did at the time. <laughs> but, it, it, you know, now, like I said, we get used to whatever we have. So, so wonderful. So when, so when this momentous occasion happened and women were ready to go vote, what happened then? Did the women go and vote or were, were they detained or you know, told by their husbands, brothers, no, you shouldn't go vote. What what happened at, the, at this first year or two when they were, there was actually voting? A lot of women did vote. And a lot of women voted as their husbands or fathers did. I mean, you think about it, this is a whole new concept. Who are you going to vote for? And think about this, Kimberly, back then, all they had were newspapers and letters. They didn't have long distance as we know it. Of course, they didn't have social media, didn't have the internet. I mean, but they persisted. And what is significant is that the outgrowth from the suffrage movement was when Carrie Chapman Catt, who headed up the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA, she was a protege of Susan B. Anthony. She founded the League of Women Voters in February of 1920. So that's a direct outgrowth from the suffrage movement. And the League is still with us. They do great work. And so the League was one of the lasting legacies from the suffrage movement. And a lot of women became involved in activities and in public policy. I mean, that's another thing that came out of the suffrage movement, particularly in the 19 teens with the progressive era. And there were women who were paying attention to inadequacies and poverty and public health issues. So much came from the 19 teens and after the ratification of the 19th Amendment that influenced our public policy. Beautiful. And, you know, now you look at today and you look at the senators and House of Representatives and, you know, there's women represented there quite well. And it's all because of the work that they did. I mean, every woman today who votes or runs for office or has a credit card or owns property can thank the suffragists because their victory made it possible for all of these things to happen in our society. We owe them a great debt of gratitude. Yeah. So tell me about these monuments. I mean, this, uh, even the, the picture of the one uh, monument you showed was just so beautiful. So well, tell you. me about the monuments and where they were placed and, and, and how you went about doing that. And, and uh, I think I remember you saying that you actually even had to uh, kind of fight to get those put up. Okay, here's the thing. If this had been easy to do, it would have been done long before now. <laughs> <laughs> so this bar relief sculpture hanging inside the Tennessee State Capitol building in Nashville happened because of then State Senator Steve Cohen, who is my congressman. Steve is the one who realized that public art is necessary because it indicates what we as a society think is important. Now you think about this, whenever you travel, 
whatever city or town you go into and you see some public art, you know what they think is important. You know if that person was someone significant in their area's history. Mm -hmm. Well, let us talk about the dearth of statuary about women. Think about how many monuments or statues or pieces of public art that you see that feature women. Very few. So after Steve led the fight, I want to tell you what happened. He said to me, we're going to get some public art and I'm going to put you on this committee. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tell me what I need to do. So I go to these meetings with the Tennessee Arts Commission. We had the best time. We had all of these artists submitting their proposals. And of course, I hadn't really paid that much attention to public art. You know, I was in the newspaper business. I mean, if I had to cover a story, yeah, I'd do it. But I wasn't someone with an arts background. I was primarily journalism and music. I studied piano. I thought I was going to be a background session player in Nashville because I grew up in Nashville. And, you know, my parents used to live next door to George Jones and Tammy Wynette briefly. And so growing up in Nashville, music is everywhere and I went to music school so I never really paid much attention to public art and then when Steve put me on this committee I started thinking well there just aren't very many statues of women why is that so Alan McQuire in Nashville who is a fabulous sculptor and artist won this blind competition so people said to us, well, why didn't you pick a woman? Well, Alan won the blind competition, and he deserved it. This bas-relief sculpture is fabulous, and it tells the story of what happened in Tennessee. So after we unveiled it in February of 98, and Carolyn got to see it, this is before she died, and one of the attorneys in Knoxville, Wanda Sobieski, commissioned Alan to do a monument in Knoxville. And she asked me, she wanted to represent the three grand divisions. Tennessee is referred to as three states, East, Middle, and West. And I'm in West Tennessee. I grew up in Middle Tennessee, went to college in East Tennessee. Tennessee is full of interesting people and great history. So Wanda commissions Allen. She raises the money. And they unveiled the Knoxville Memorial in 06. And I put Elizabeth Avery Merriweather from Memphis on there because Elizabeth Avery Merriweather represented West Tennessee among the three grand divisions. So then after we got that one done, Alma Sanford in Nashville, who is a retired attorney and my good friend, said to me in 2010, you know, 2020 is not that far off and we need something in Nashville. Now, Kimberly, I'm just going to tell you, the state wasn't going to do it. They'll do all kinds of stuff for the Confederacy and Civil War, but they're not going to do anything for women. So Alma and I talked and talked and talked, and she put together a statewide board and put me on it. And we started talking about what we wanted to have outside the Capitol. Well, long story short, state didn't really care. They didn't want it. So the reason we have monuments in Knoxville, Nashville, Clarksville, Jackson, and Memphis is because of the mayors. The mayors in each of those cities wanted this public art. It is great for heritage tourism. It tells the stories. Little girls and boys get to see women depicted in statuary. And this is what I tell people every time I speak. When we're all gone, those monuments and markers will still be there telling the story. That's why we do it. That is so true. When you were talking about, you know, women were like underrepresented. I remember even, you know, touring in, in, in um, Europe and the same thing there. Very few women statuaries, just almost all men. And so, yeah, to, to actually bring that forward and, and women's con contributions to democracy, especially here in this country, it's just beautiful. So if you were, and I think you already do this, but you were going to go into um, the colleges right now 
and speak to the young people there. There are people in their, you know, teens, 20s, maybe early 30s. What is it that you tell them? What things do you want them to remember? Which things, how do you want them to think about the history? That the suffrage movement was the greatest nonviolent revolution in the history of our country. That American women and the men who supported them, because I always point this out, it was the men in those 36 state legislatures who voted to willingly share power. And I want them to understand that not everybody came over on the Mayflower and had the right to vote. That's not how our history unfolded. But that this was a significant political and social movement and that the suffragists proved our constitution works and democracy works. The suffragists believe democracy is not a spectator sport. Beautiful. And then just from a practical standpoint, how should the young people coming up, how should they use this information? How should it help them as far as uh, making decisions, participating? Register to vote. Support the people who align with your goals and values and run for office if you want to. I applaud people who run for office. I don't want to do it, but I want to support people. And I've supported a lot of candidates, you know, primarily women, but there are a lot of great men out there. And I want to tell you the hero to me and in the Tennessee suffrage movement, and Carolyn Yellen always said this, Representative Joseph Hanover from Memphis his family fled the Tsar in Poland, and his father came to the United States first, ended up in Memphis, sent the money back to his mother. They were whisked out of Poland, crossed the lake, managed to get on the boat, got off at Ellis Island, made their way down to Memphis. He ended up running for office because the question he had was, after his parents became naturalized citizens, why can't mother vote? Why can't mother vote? His father could, his mother couldn't, and they couldn't explain it to him. And his parents impressed upon him and his brothers. They were living in the greatest country on earth. They needed to study the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution. He revered those founding documents, and he ran for office in 1919 and help lead the fight for limited suffrage, which Tennessee approved in April of 1919. And then Congress actually ratified, I mean, excuse me, approved the uh, 19th Amendment, June 4th, 1919, and sent it to the states for ratification. Because remember, three quarters of the states had to ratify the amendment. And we only had 48 states in 1919 and 1920. So 36 of 48 is three quarters, which is what's required for ratification. So Representative Hanover, who I actually met in 1983, I mean, Kimberly, that shows you how recent this history is. He died in April of 84. He was the last remaining member of the 1920 Tennessee legislature to die. And so I met him and Carolyn said to me, he was the hero because he kept those pro suffrage votes together and it ended up passing actually by two votes and they made history. He made history. He lived to be 95 years old. It's just remarkable what he did. He was a great humanitarian. He was a lawyer. He loved the Mississippi River and I'm down here by the Mississippi River. And he was just a great man. And so my friend Bill Halton in Memphis, who's a great attorney and author, wrote the book, Why Can't Mother Vote? Joseph Hanover and the Unfinished Business of Democracy. And Carolyn Yellen would have been so thrilled. So I helped edit that book. I'm really proud of it. So with the Perfect 36 book and the Joseph Hanover book, we feel like we really told the story about how victory occurred with Tennessee's pivotal vote. Beautiful. And I'm just thinking in general of, you know, people and their ability to vote or to have a voice and, you know, all the work that the women did those 72 years. And then, you know, later on, there was a big group of people, the Blacks, who, who weren't allowed to vote, both men and women. And I'm thinking, you know, how 
did the work that your the women did early on how did that actually affect when when the um, blacks were you know wanting to do that same thing do you see a, a connection there and and did they go about it the same way or did did you think they kind of took from what you did well let me tell you what happened the 15th amendment extended the right to vote to the newly freed black male slaves the 14th amendment is the first time the word male m-a-l-e appears in the constitution but the 15th amendment was to extend the right to vote to the black male slaves, not women. That's why the 19th Amendment was so important and so necessary. Now, you'll hear the stories about, oh, the 19th Amendment discriminated, blah, blah, blah. Let me just tell you this. This country has always had systemic racism. The 19th Amendment does not say anything about race. Were the suffragists racist? Well, of course they were. Some of them were, most of them probably were. But the 19th Amendment itself did not discriminate. And let me point this out to you. Our Constitution does not guarantee the right to vote. Were you aware of that? It does uh -huh. not guarantee it. The 15th Amendment, even though it extended the right to black men, did not guarantee that right, just as the 19th Amendment did not guarantee. What it did was remove restrictions. The Constitution grants the right, but it is the states that implement the policies and procedures that affect voting. And that's where the voter suppression and the racism comes in. It's the states. Wow. And that's why the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was so important because it enforced the provisions of the 15th and 19th Amendments. And there is a school of thought that has said that if the 19th Amendment had not been ratified, there is no guarantee that Black women or women of color would have been able to access the vote. So that's why it's important that the 15th and 19th Amendments are in the Constitution and the Voting Rights Amendment, which unfortunately was eviscerated by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2013. But you know what? That can be undone. We always have to make sure that, you know, Carol Lynn Yellen used to say that women go through life doing the two step, two steps forward, one step backward. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So what we have to do is keep our eye on the prize and do everything we can to make sure that voting rights are fully implemented and enforced. Amen. <laughs> Amen. That is so true. So um, just so people can, you know, get to your resources, you've written the book, you have YouTube videos. Um, where's the, how's the best way for them to reach you or connect with you or, you know, find your books and resources. Okay, the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Heritage Trail, which is TN for Tennessee Woman. And let me point this out. The early suffragists believed that W-O-M-A-N was plural and inclusive. So they referred to it as woman suffrage. That's why our book is Tennessee Delivers Woman Suffrage. So TN Woman Suffrage Heritage Trail .com has all our information and I'm on there as one of the co-founders. The Perfect 36, theperfect36.com is about the book. And my YouTube channel is Paula F. Casey. So I've got a lot of information on there. And I'm really excited that 2026 is going to give us the opportunity to really promote this history. And I'm a new board member of the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. And we're doing our part to be a part of America 250. And that's another great website, America 250, America250.org, all about the plans to celebrate the 250th anniversary. This, it's hard to believe. It seems like 1976 just happened. <laughs> it does go fast, doesn't it? 
So, well, now I have a just a personal question for you that I ask everybody on the podcast. What gives you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life at this point? Oh, what a great question. I think being grateful for good health, a great family, great friends, and the opportunity to talk about this history and do my part to help preserve it. I feel like I'm doing what Carolyn Yellen wanted. And I just think it is so important that we remember those who came before us. So it makes me really happy to get this public art done, to have the books, the DVD, you know, all of the great things that we're doing to make sure this history is preserved and to promote democracy. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for all your knowledge. I've learned so much and we even had a conversation before the podcast. And I've learned more since we've been on the podcast. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. It is so great that you provide this platform and I'm just honored to be invited. Thank you. Yeah. So I have one last question before we complete. What is your best advice on living an amazing, incredible life? Gratitude. Every day, we've got to have gratitude. No matter, no matter how bad things seem, they get better. It will get better. And we've got to be grateful for the things that happen. And also to tell ourselves that we are where we need to be. And to just accept the great things that happen in life, the good, the bad, it, everything happens. And the question is, how do we deal with it? How do we respond? And you can make that choice. The choice is how we respond to what happens to us. So as I've gotten older, I like to think I've gotten a little bit mellower, that I'm not quite as quick to react, that I want to think things through. I also want to be gentle with people and gentle with myself. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be with you. And we'll talk to you again soon.